Thank you, esteemed colleagues, uh, my rivals, I salute you. Movies unite us. Movies <laughs> bring us together. Movies are America. Before baseball, radio, and television, there was movies. <laughs> movies are easy to bullshit about because everyone sees them. My friends, the problem with books is that no matter how good they are, they have such a little impact on us. A case in point, I will go back to my childhood when a wonderful uh, series of billboards came out with a dinosaur on them, and I said, what the fuck is that? I need this now. <laughs> my dad said, it's a book. You should read the book first. And I did, and it was one of the greatest mistakes I've ever made. <laughs> I read the Michael Crichton Jurassic Park just a month before the movie came out. And sure, yeah, that was great to see, oh, science. Science, well, through science, what would genetic engineering look like if it actually happened? <laughs> There would be a lot of ethical problems they would have to discuss. And I decided for a good six weeks that I didn't like Jurassic Park. And then it came out and I was like, all right, dinosaurs! Fucking dinosaurs! Ripping apart lawyers and fat guys. That's what, that's all we need dinosaurs. Well, before that, we didn't even know what dinosaurs looked like. Our mental image of a dinosaur was, oh, a picture I saw in a book about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, dinosaurs are giant things that you can imitate in front of your schoolmates and become very popular from doing. <laughs> Fuck Michael Crichton and thank you, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> I, I, I didn't understand the ethical implications of tinkering with an extinct species until I saw Wayne Knight ripped apart by a dinosaur that had fans coming out of his neck. <laughs> Now, perhaps that's an easy target. Uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, a movie from 1949, The Third Man. Um, uh, Graham Greene uh, turned that into a book. One of the few uh, novelizations, I'll add, that is not only came after the movie, but it was also much worse than the movie. That was a fantastically exciting movie, and then the one thing that's not in the book is the great cuckoo clock speech that Orson Welles does. The cuckoo clock. That's not in it. Hey, you ruined it. Great job, Graham. Maybe the quiet American should speak up sometime. It's a great green joke. I like this crowd. An occasional misstep with movies. Right? We all we all know that. I could waste our, all of our time by de delving into it. But the, when our time is wasted by books, the results are much worse. We get people like Christopher Hitchens or George Hagel. <laughs> Vicious, vinegar-filled bastards and someone who should have never written anything at all. Sorry, Hagel. Um, I struggled for a week and a half to read the first chapter of Phenomenology of Spirit, and then I decided to go watch a lot of, of fucking Woody Allen movies, and I think that was a better use of my time. Sorry. <laughs> That was the thesis that I should read Hegel, and then there's an anti-thesis that I can't. And then the synthesis was go watch a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> Hegel joke, you guys are a very good audience. Thank you. I go back to <laughs> That's a pretty literary joke you made. What's that? Pretty Hold on, sir! How dare how dare you, sir? <laughs> because you saw Interplay? Sir, I'll have you know that when I perform, cameras are rolling. <laughs> no one reads books; they don't have the impact. We were taught, we we brought up uh, oh, 1984 as uh, that was. It is a boring book. Thank you for pointing that out, Joe. Uh, me, yeah. Guess what? If the NSA scandal wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been so fucking boring. Make more exciting movies about the dystopia next time. That's a challenge to all of us, really. Fumble verbally, perhaps, but a challenge nonetheless. Uh, people, people do not see. Uh, people don't watch books like the way, like the way they should. Um, they don't have the impact. There's, 
there's authors who toil in obscurity who are fine, who are fantastic, and no one's ever read them. Charles Portis makes you makes me laugh out loud as much as any of the funniest podcasts do. No one has ever read Charles Portis. Uh, the Big Lebowski, we all have. Because initially, yeah, nobody saw The Big Lebowski, but then they were like, you gotta see this. They're like, I can do that, that's easy. <laughs> you can't go to someone and be like, hey, wanna go read uh, the works of an author? It doesn't, no one understands that there's laughter behind that. <laughs> Movies and books share a common ancestor. <laughs> <laughs> Movies and books share a common ancestor. I'm gonna go ahead and say that it's uh, campfire tales that we were taught. So if you, uh, it, 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 it's human entertainment. That's what uh, that's what we talk about when we talk about uh, film, cinema, or literary arts. Um, why did we? Why did some of us go in one direction and go? Let's make this into entertaining, and it lasted a long way. And some were like, "Let's take the campfire into a small room and scrim it away, <laughs> so that only more bald, myopic people can understand what we believe." <laughs> I, I credit books and too much reading with the fact that I have to wear glasses and I'm losing my hair. <laughs> No one's, uh, I, I never read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but Seven Years in Tibet was a fantastic movie preview. <laughs> another beef I have, I don't know if another beef I have, uh, yeah, there's no book previews. That would save us a lot of time. Just come out with a book preview. And sorry, I can't, I'm not smart enough to read the New York Times review of books. <laughs> Papyrus scrolls of Khufu and Khafra and King Tutankhamun are all gone, but Cleopatra reigns forever. <laughs> <laughs> the autobiography of T.E. Lawrence. <laughs> I remember Dad used it to keep the bathroom door open. <laughs> but it was only when I sat through the first half and a little bit of the second half of the Lawrence of Arabia movie. I tried, my darlings, I tried. <laughs> I don't understand rich people shit. It was not available to me. I, the subtleties were lost. If you show some rich people, I'm like, oh yeah, he's the asshole, that's a good guy. <laughs> I'm not illiterate. I <laughs> am proud to be the only person who's ever recognized James Howard Kunstler in an airport. I know this because he told me. I was the only person who'd ever recognized James Howard Kunstler in an airport. But no one, the, the Kunstler? Who? What? The lawyer? The bad word? No. Wait till the movie comes out. If his predictions don't hold up. <laughs> Kunstler joke didn't work. <laughs> Uh, of course, it's hard to have a discussion about film and literature without going back to the bard himself, uh, perhaps the, the nexus of those two worlds. Um, and I've trod the boards, repeating the words uh, of the poet of Avon a few times. I rescued what otherwise would have been a disastrous production of Julius Caesar in the Whittier College production of Julius Caesar in 2001. But I would offer to you that uh, the books of Shakespeare uh, are worthless unless acted out on stage, which is pretty fucking close to a movie. And why? Why would you gamble to see what local theater company has come up with when you can see the Kenneth Branagh movie version of almost any Shakespeare play? You get the best actors that were available that six months, probably. <laughs> them otherwise. And yes, they whisper, you have to listen hard. That is an education. In conclusion, and I do conclude, thank you.